way to our Learn at Home. And um, if this is your first time tuning into our Learn at Home live lessons, we've been doing um, this program for around three months now since um, you know lockdown started. And this program, we're able to bring it to you through generous donor support and our sponsors, um, particularly the Gene Senator Legacy Fund. And we're just so grateful for all of our supporters and the engagement that we've got we've gotten from folks through our virtual programming. And um, if it's your first time, every single week we have a different theme that relates to um, topics like water, trees, um, wildlife, um, waste, uh, plants, and just a variety of environmental topics that relate to LA. And we also have live lessons like this one, as well as experts that sometimes come on, come and join us. For example, we had a soil professor join us for Soul Week. And uh, we also had um, special guest speakers for our Urban Heat Week, which was the week before last. So it's, it's really exciting and it's been a great journey um, the past several months, just growing this program with you all. And, and if you've been following us, then thank you so much. And um, we are you know, supported through donor support. So if you would like to donate to Learn at Home, you can just go to our website, treepeople.org slash donate, and we would love and appreciate any amount of um, support. So thank you so much. And um, this is a way that even though we don't have the opportunity to hold in-person voluntary events during this time, um, having these live lessons is a way for us to inspire you to continue to do green, green projects at home, to take on um, environmental, you know, fun projects at home. So our live lessons, we try to focus on how to and practical um, components that you can actually do at home with your family. And so today I'm really excited to be bringing you the rainwater harvesting lesson because it's extremely practical. We have our water expert, Chris, who is amazing and she has done amazing things with her home. And as you'll learn from her, water conservation is a big topic in Los Angeles and it's more important than ever to capture, collect and harvest rainwater. So I hope you enjoy and thank you again for being here. So would you like to introduce yourself, Chris? Sure, hi everybody. I'm Chris Imhoff. I am Tree People's Director of Program Development. Uh, I have been with Tree People a long time, for over 35 years, believe it or not, <laughs> and I have um, been responsible for helping to develop uh, a lot of our core programs at Tree People, including um, our how-to guides, resources, and videos, which uh, um, I'm super excited to share some of those with you today and that we will be sure to send to you at the end of uh, our session today. Awesome. And just to introduce myself quickly, um, my name is Emmy, and I'm a youth leadership coordinator for our environmental education department. And I'm just here moderating the session for you all today. Yay. Okay, so rainwater harvesting at home. Um, this is a 101 session. Uh, it's it's pretty much for beginners. I'm going to take a I'm going to share with you today on how to kind of look at your home and map it and think about um, some places that might work in your in your site for rainwater harvesting and we'll go through uh, some of the various different things that you can consider. So uh, you're welcome to take notes, but I, as I said before, I wanted to let you know up front that we have a variety of videos, how-to guides. I have a home assessment tool that I'll be talking about today and lots of resources that we will send you afterwards via email. Uh, so, okay, let's get started. All right. So today we're gonna to talk about ways that you can capture and or infiltrate the rain, what we call rainwater harvesting. Um, but before we get started, I would love to get some of your thoughts on why should we uh, harvest the rain? Any thoughts about that? So use your chat room and go ahead and tell me why, why should we harvest rain? It is liquid gold. 
to reduce the use of municipal water, most definitely. Save on water bills, yes. These are all great. And uh, to replenish groundwater. See, we've got a lot of people who already know what they're talking about. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's about saving our water, isn't it? Um, all right, so let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at what we're talking. Reduce electricity use. Yes, Katie, most definitely. Um, so this is a picture of a watershed, right? I typically, when I'm talking about rainwater harvesting, I always like to start out with the watershed uh, because we, we live in a watershed. A watershed, it's the land area that channels rainfall and snow melt into creeks and streams and rivers and eventually to a large body of water, such as it could be a reservoir, a bay, or like here in LA, it's our ocean, right? And so when we have a healthy watershed, uh, we also have water that can percolate into the land and, that, and, and allow that water to fill in our aquifers. The aquifers are down below the land, our soil, uh, in, and has pockets where water is kept that we can actually draw from um, for our use. And so it's really important uh, here in LA because we're part of a, we have a Mediterranean climate where we only get about six months of rain. The rest of the year, like now during the summer, uh, we don't get any rain at all. And so it's really helpful to be able to capture as much of that rain when we have it. All right. So Here's another picture of our watershed. I love the picture here on the left because you can really see the mountains, the valley. You can see the, the actual watershed. Uh, if you see there along the back mountains, we've got our Angeles, our Santa Monica Mountains, the Santa Susanas, and you can really picture how water moves from higher places to lower places, right? And, and our watershed makes its way from those mountains across the landscape. Uh, to the ocean. And if you look carefully, um, just to the right of that picture there on the left, you can see where the LA River makes its way out into the Long Beach Bay. All right, exactly. Um, but if we look a little closer at that watershed, um, you can see that most of the land there on the right is paved over. There is miles and miles of concrete and asphalt that prevent the water from getting into the ground. Uh, and if you look carefully in this picture, you can actually see the LA River winding its way through the middle of that picture, only it's, it's not like an actual, uh, it's lined in concrete. So, so even our river is covered in concrete, right? So when the rain hits these hard impermeable surfaces, rather than sinking into the land, most of it runs off to the ocean, uh, and this is called urban runoff. And when, when, when all that urban runoff flows across concrete and asphalt and other surfaces uh, and makes its way to the, uh, to the ocean, that's a lot, uh, of, uh, a lot of water that is wasted, right? And so um, we actually lose a lot of the little amount of water that we receive in rain. In fact, um, only 12% of our water is from local groundwater. The rest we have to import. And, and to do that, it, it takes a lot of money and a lot of resources and a lot of electricity, right? And so to give you an idea of uh, the, the amount of loss of water, when it rains one inch in the city of LA, 3.8 billion gallons of water rushes off to the ocean. 3.8 billion, that's a lot of water. And so um, there are 3.8 million people in the city of LA. So in essence, that means that when we get one inch of rain, there's a thousand gallons of water for each person that is treated like waste and sent down our streets and into our storm drains to the ocean. So just think if every person could capture some of that water we wouldn't have to import as much, right? So, so what can we do about that? So your home is actually a mini watershed, right? We have water that moves from higher places to lower places and our homes are designed to shed water from your site. 
right? And right into the street. Um, and so water comes off of your roof, down downspouts, pretty much directed onto your driveway and, and heads it straight into the street. And so um, what if we could, you know, prevent that water from, from becoming wasted or polluted runoff? And so if you think of your roof and your driveway, kind of like a flat cookie sheet, right? Imagine all those flat surfaces that um, when it rains an inch, it doesn't seem like a lot of water, but if you spread it out over all those flat surfaces like your roof and your driveway, that's a lot of water that could be collected. So for example, if, you if, if you're collecting a half of inch rain on a thousand square feet, that's 600 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. So, so we wanna see how much of that runner we can actually capture and, um, and what are some solutions we can implement to do that. So the first step, uh, the first step is to create a map of your site, right? So I'm gonna be sending you a, um, a, a DIY assessment tool that kind of gives you the guidelines that I'm talking about to, to look at yourself and look at your site and create a map. Um, it, can be, it can be technical with graph paper and precise with measurements, or it can be very simple, like the image on the screen. You know, basically you want to lay out all the major structures and landscape surfaces as the foundation of your map. I literally took a piece of notebook paper and just went outside and started drawing to get a real sense of what we're looking at. Um, you'll want to add a compass rose that's there on the left. You know, it's an arrow that shows the direction of north. It's always nice that if you're creating a map of your site and you're kind of looking at where you're going to be making some uh, green infrastructure changes, it's good to have a compass rose, especially if you're going to consider where you might put trees uh, or other, other structures. Um, so looking at the map, if you want to capture and filtrate some of the rainwater, um, what you're adding on to this map, you'll see here are Ds. And D stands for downspout, okay? So on my uh, map here, we've got downspouts pretty much around the corners of each of the structures, right? Um, and so basically looking at this picture, just some quick thinking, you know, you're gonna kind of consider where water's coming off of these structures. And you might look at the downspout coming off the garage and how maybe some of that water could be directed away from the driveway. You might be looking at the downspouts in the backyard and maybe collecting some of that water uh, to, to water your garden or potted plants, right? Or you might even look at downspout extensions off of the downspouts in the front to help direct rainwater into a tree or a garden. So, what I'm saying is you're creating yourself a visual of your home and starting to think about the various different spaces that you have and what you have to work with. So let's take a look at some of these options. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, more to the map. There we go. So we're, before we look at more options, you're gonna add more to the map. And like I said, I have instructions that will tell you all the different elements. So looking at the map right now, we've added a tree. That's the dot with the, with the specks around it there to the right. Um, we've added a W and, and a G and those are your meters, right? It'll be important for you to identify where, your, where the meters are in case you're doing any sort of excavation in that area. Um, for me at my house, typically these run right perpendicular. So if you find the water meter out in front of your yard, typically it's a straight line to your house. Uh, at my home, the, the gas line is over to the side and the water is more toward the middle. Um, you'll be adding in the dash and the circle is kind of showing you where you might have sprinkler system. And then uh, really important is adding the direction that water travels. And so as you'll see here, Emmy put a line across the middle of the, of the big building, the, the home there, and that's showing where the arc of the roof is, right? So you've got two different catchment areas happening on your roof. So the back end where water travels off the top of the roof toward the backyard, 
uh, is one area of catchment of rain that is directed to those two back downspouts, right? And then the front part is another catchment area directing rainwater toward the front of the house and those downspouts. Uh, the small building that that's the little garage there, the direction of the roof is, is a little different. You've got water traveling to the left and to the right. All right, so now that you have your map and you have a sense of the direction that your water is traveling, let's, uh, let's take a look at some options. All right, so one way to capture rainwater from your roof is into a rain barrel, right? So, uh, or what we can call a rain tank, some sort of a, of a tank that can, can collect water. When looking at your map, where are the, there's some downspouts that are close to where you would use the water, perhaps in the backyard. I found it's a lot easier to situate your rain barrel where you're gonna actually use that water. Otherwise, you know, sometimes it's a, if it's off on the side yard, it's forgotten. And so uh, I have one in the backyard that I use to water uh, my, my planters in the back and my potted plants. Um, and so uh, to, we're going to give this a try to give you a better idea of what's involved in, in installing a rain barrel. We're going to show this short video. We'll see if it works. If not, then we'll talk about it. Today, we're going to learn how to install a rain tank. Installing a rain tank at your home is a great way to capture rainwater to help keep your trees and garden alive while creating a drought smart Los Angeles. Before you get started, see where water can be diverted from your roof. There's tons of possibilities. To install a basic rain tank, you will need one bag of gravel, similar to this, two cinder blocks and 16 inch square pavers sheet metal screws and anchors, one hot water heater earthquake strap, a downspout elbow and brackets, tin snips, a drill, needle nose pliers, hacksaw, level, screwdriver, tape measure, and safety glasses. Now we're ready to get started. First, we'll start digging down around six to 12 inches back filled with gravel. Don't forget to make sure the ground is stable. Then, create a sandwich base to raise the rain barrel. Now, let's see where to shorten the downspout. Once you find it, mark it and use a hacksaw to make your cut. Use tin snips to cut slits in the end and needle nose pliers to crimp them inward, then slide it inside the elbow. Secure the elbow to the wall with a bracket so it doesn't slide out. Don't forget to secure your barrel with earthquake straps. Now attach a hose to the overflow and direct it into the landscape. Nicely done. You're ready to capture those drops. Thanks for doing your part to support a climate resilient LA. Learn more at treepeople.org. Nice, nice. So you know, it's it's not that complicated and uh, this video and some, some written instructions will have available for you too. Um, so in the next slide, depending on the size of your roof and that catchment area, one, one tank, one, one rain barrel that holds about 55, 60 gallons, is not going to be enough. In fact, it's going to be really important that you have that hose to the overflow that it talked about in the video, because if we get a really good storm, that tank is going to fill up and you're going to need that extra water to go to be directed into your landscape. But another solution, especially um, uh, if you have room, like along the side of a garage or whatnot, you can actually um, put multiple barrels in there. And so as you can see here, uh, we did just like in the video where you've got the gravel and the, um, uh, the, the cinder blocks raising it up and it's all attached to the wall, but then we attach the different uh, barrels together using Y splitters. And these are easily found at a home improvement or you can get it online. But these wire split, these Y splitters essentially direct the water into two different areas. 
And so um, for the barrels on the end, you'll close those, but open up the valves all in between. And so um, uh, what happens is as the water comes into the one tank, as it starts to fill up, it's going to fill all the other tanks simultaneously, right? And then uh, it's great because on the end, you can, you can add a hose when you're ready to use that water. Um, for those, if you're, if you're interested in purchasing these, Tree People in the past, we've worked with Rain Barrels International. Uh, they utilize reuse barrels that were once used for pickles or, and other you know, similar products, and they've actually retrofitted them, uh, which is great because they, the, these sort of um, barrels would be used in the landfill, uh, but instead they're retrofitted and now being used for rain barrels, which is terrific. And they come in black and terracotta, uh, like the ones in these pictures. Um, I believe they cost about $65 each, but what's great is that if you go to SoCal WaterSmart, uh, and we have instructions for you to do that as well, um, I believe right now you can get a rebate for $35 uh, per barrel for up to two barrels. So it's really worth it to be able to, to collect some of that rain. Um, all right, so let's... Uh, take a look at another use of rain barrel, right? So I have a rain barrel in my backyard that I have, that I use to collect air conditioner condensate. So the moisture that's collected um, from my air conditioning unit tip, used to, um, it, it, the water condensates and then that water is pumped out. It go to this hose across my, the top of my roof and down into just the, the space next to the house where it would drain. So what I did instead was I installed a rain barrel here um, so that while I may not be collecting water in my barrels when it's during the summer, I'm collecting rainwater from the condensate all summer long. So uh, go ahead and, and hit the video. Oh. Here it is coming from my air conditioning unit being pumped up and instead of just falling to the next to the foundation of my house um I get a bunch uh it's like I said it depends on on how how much your air conditioning is going um how long uh will de depend but but I've got water in that tank pretty much all summer long especially during hot weeks uh, but another solution if you want to collect if you want to collect water. All right, so as you look at your map, here's another really lovely thing that you can do. Um, rain chains are just a great way to enhance your garden instead of a downspout. Um, they are a simple vehicle for water to get down from your roof and either into a rain barrel, as, as you can see there on the left. Um, they look really pretty or, you know, right into your garden into anchored down into a basin of rocks or stones or into what we're going to be talking about later into a swale to redirect the water away. And so um, uh, rain chains are great and they're beautiful and some make beautiful sounds. Uh, and you'll have to check out our video this week on social media because um, we put together a video, a, a DIY, how to make your own rain chain using, I think, some fun um, metal butterflies and, and linking them all together between chains and, and hooking that up. And so when it rains, all that water comes down along there and it looks really pretty during uh, when it's not raining. So uh, again, check out this video and think about putting in a rain chain. So another way to prevent runoff is to redirect water into the ground. Uh, to do this, we do what is called earthworks. Uh, it's how we move the soil around to help slow the water flow, help spread it out, and then allow that water to sink into the ground. Uh, the goal basically is to keep as much water on site as possible. Um, another term for this is bioretention. 
um, bio meaning life, plants and uh, soil and retention is, is capturing or retaining water. So again, the goal is to decrease runoff to infiltrate that water and actually create a really nice landscape aesthetic. You know, it's it's so nice looking at, um, rather than kind of a flat yard or just flat grass these days, you know, it's, it's about adding flow to your garden space. And, and um, some of you may have seen some bioretention basins used in the community. Uh, such as at the edges of parking lots or in parkways um, where water is redirected off of parking lots and into the streets. I live over by Pierce College and it was really incredible to see them when they were redoing their parking lot to actually have the parking lot slope toward bioswales so that when it rains, all that water that comes off of the, the parking lot and, and the oil and grease from the cars are now directed into a bioretention basin along the whole edge of the parking lot where that water can be captured and filtered out and get down into the aquifer. It's pretty terrific. All right, so let's see what this means for our own landscapes. So what we're talking about is incorporating berms and swales. Berms are the raised areas of soil, right? And, there, and whereas swales are the dips. Um, swales are a depression to direct that water through the landscape. You can make them more, uh, like V-shaped or U-shaped uh, slope. Um, and and they, the depression, I mean, think of a dry creek bed, right? So it, it can be long and, it, and it's sloped in and it's filled with rocks and stones and plants or mulch. Um, and it's basically designed, like I said, to to slow that water as it's flowing through from kind of a higher slope downward, allowing that water to slow down, spread out and sink in. Um, and so uh, in your yards, it can be used to move and direct water, say from a downspout away from the foundation of your house, or it can be used to redirect water into um, a bioretention, a larger bioretention basin, or a rain garden. So let's take, so you may consider installing a rain garden. Uh, that's what you see in this picture here. It's kind of a, 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 bi, a large bioretention basin. So what you're seeing here is my front yard years ago when I first put it in um, and I redirected a downspout from my garage into a small swale that you see there on the right, the rocks, uh, and directs it right into the basin, um, which you know I created by digging down and then taking that soil and building up berms around the outside edge of that um, rain garden. Yes, thank you, Emmy. I also extended that berm out uh, beyond it, beyond that large rock. And then I even created a berm off on the far edge there, uh, again, just to kind of add some, a different aesthetic to the garden, to allow water a chance to slow down and uh, add more interest to the garden. Um, I added a pathway and a sitting area. Um, so in looking at this space, um, you wanna be sure that you're looking at a place that gets full sun or partial shade, uh, that it's at least about three feet from, from hardscape. So it's, it's three feet in from the sidewalk there. Um, uh, it's not directly under the tree canopy, but it's, it's under a deciduous tree. So most of the time when it's raining, it, it's not in a shaded area and it dries up pretty quickly. Um, and, and, um, and speaking of that, let's see, if you go to the next slide, one of the things you'll want to do is to evaluate your soil, okay? So you want to be sure that if you're going to put a rain garden in, that that water is actually going to be able to infiltrate, right? So one of the first things I did was to, um, to do a soil permeability test. It's, it's pretty basic. 
and I have instructions for you for how to do that as well. Um, but basically you're digging a hole, probably about as deep as the blade of the, of the shovel. You're filling it up with water and you're seeing how long it takes to drain. So mine drained uh, easily within an hour, which, which is great. And if you have soil that is taking hours, like more than six hours to drain, then your site may not be a good place for a rain garden. Okay, as you don't want to have pooling water, especially during a rainstorm, right? And so it's, it's a good idea to evaluate the soil. So the other thing you're going to do is you're going to want to determine the size that you will need to make the rain garden. So again, depending on the square footage of that catchment area that I talked about, you know, you're going back and looking at your map, you're going to want to um, measure out the catchment area of the roof space that is going to be directed into the downspout uh, where you're going to be directing water into a rain garden, right? And so uh, you're, you end up multiplying the width by the length of the catchment area to get, to get your square footage, right? And so using this picture, that's about 500 square feet. Then you multiply that catchment area by the amount of rainfall. And so when we're calculating out a rain garden, um, it should be sized to capture at least three quarters inch of rain uh, that will fall on that catchment area. So you'll be multiplying it by 0 0.0625 feet. Then you're gonna divide it, that by the depth of the rain garden, which should be about six inches. So you'll be dividing by 0.5. So Using this illustration, um, that gives us about 62.5 square feet to work with. And so that can determine kind of how long or wide your, uh, your rain garden can be sized. So it could be about seven feet by nine feet. It could be eight by seven and a half feet, or it could be long, maybe 10 feet by six. I hope this makes sense, but, but again, all these instructions will have for you, but, but this will depend on, again, the catchment area and the space you have for that rain, for that water to come into. Um, if you don't have as much space, you can make your rain garden a little deeper. So your calculations will be a little different. So I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, so here is a couple years after I first put in that rain garden there on the left. I've added additional elements. Um, I've added uh, more of my native plants. Um, the, the California fuchsia that you see there um, on the, uh, the red flowers, they're the pretty um, blue gray plants that you see there in the left of my photo. Those spread and are gorgeous. And right now they are just taking over a good portion of my rain garden. But what's so fabulous about them is that uh, while in the spring, a lot of my flowers are blooming, in the winter, I get the California fuchsia. So they're really beautiful. And then um, my yarrow and my sticky monkey flower that you see here are also in my garden and I love them. Um, uh, the far in the background here by the rock, I have a purple sage that now is huge. And, and so since then, uh, my garden natives have really filled out the space that you don't necessarily see that there's a basin. It just looks like a beautiful yard of, uh, of native flowering plants. Um, the other thing that you'll want is actually uh, this other great um, element that is great for rainwater harvesting, and that's the use of mulch. And so all my soil, open soil areas in the base of my um, rain garden is filled with mulch. Uh, it not only helps create healthy soil for the plants, but it acts like a sponge when it rains. And so it, it actually, if you have three to four inch layer of mulch over the soil areas and in between the plants, when it does rain, that, that mulch acts like a sponge that holds the water and again, allows it to slowly sink in. Uh, it's also great for holding back the weeds. Um, all right, so does it work? Let's take a look.
So here's, it's a rainy day. Water's coming through my little swale there into my basin. And you'll see, I mean, it's a good rain that's happening and it's not filling it up like a pool, right? And so um, this is the extension from my downspout that normally would be directing water onto my driveway, but instead it's redirecting it again into that swale and into the basin. And you can see a couple spots where the water is pooling up, but over time, you know, but it continually soaks in. It's a beautiful thing. I love coming out That's when it's so raining. Yes, it is, it is. All right, so, so it works, right? And so it's not like tons of water coming in and filling it up. It's great. Um, all right, so to get the, the rain from the downspout over to my garden swale, uh, it, it, I installed a downspout extension. I basically cut off the bottom where it was being directed onto the driveway, added an elbow, and then um, I used some PVC pipe. And that came across a planter and, and then it directed it right into the rain garden. Um, Downspout extensions are another really simple and inexpensive solution to redirecting rain into a garden or into your tree well, uh, and basically away from the driveway, right? Because our, our whole goal is to keep that water from being uh, wasted on into the street. So um, there are different things, different types of downspout extensions that you can get. There are metal ones. There are the accordion type, like this one on the right, where literally you just slide it onto the downspout and, and then using the accordion for however long or short you want it to be, uh, putting it in the direction of where you want that water. Uh, it's great because it actually gets the water away from the foundation of your house and like in our original map, it could be used to direct that water towards maybe the tree well, which um, trees could always use more water. Uh, there's also these here on the left, this is a flip up type. So if your downspout actually comes into an area that crosses over maybe a little pathway, um, it can flip up when it's not raining. And then if it's gonna, if a rainstorm is, com rain is coming, you can go out and put the flap down. I've also seen uh, downspouts that are um, redirected under a patio uh, um, pathway to the house. So you can put PVC pipe underneath and then it's redirected into a swale, you know, a dry creek bed. All right, so lastly, you can see where on your map you can maybe remove or reduce some hardscape to help with infiltration. Um, you can consider breaking up concrete, uh, and uh, which is lovely, like in a backyard space. Um, again, the idea is to just open up that hard, hardscape and allow water to come in. Um, it's really nice now. There are all sorts of different kind of permeable, permeable paver products um, for driveways. Um, and if you don't have as much uh, money for that, I personally, I made a cut in my driveway and I filled it with sand and then gravel so that as water's coming down, some of it can, can infiltrate. Um, so again, another, another thought or another solution. All right. So to recap, for rainwater harvesting, you know, when you're making your map, um, we're gonna look for and consider capturing rainwater in rain barrels for use in a garden area. Consider redirecting water that flows across hard surfaces and redirecting them into a bioswell or maybe a rain garden. Creating berms and swales to slow and spread and sink that water and create a really lovely new aesthetic to your yard. Consider adding downspout extensions to direct that water into the landscape and tree wells. Consider reducing hardscape by using pavers, permeable surfaces, or actually even removing it completely and replacing that with mulch and ground covers. 
And then lastly, using rain chains for fun and adding beauty to, uh, to your garden space. All awesome. Right. Thank you so much, Chris. That was so insightful. We have a ton of questions. I'm sure. So I will do my best. <laughs> I'm sure you will. So we have the first question from Janine. Um, she says, this is referring to the rain barrels. Um, single woman, not handy. Is there someone who can do this? Hmm. Who can install, help her install a rain barrel? I'm not sure. You know, um, if you go to the Rain Barrels International website, they have events um, around LA where they do the rain barrel, where they do um, rain barrel distri distributions, right? And so there are a lot of organizations that are sponsoring these. They may be able to um, help you and direct you, but um, I think you'd be surprised. You might be able to do it. But, um, but yeah, check, check with them and see if they know of resources for folks that can help you. Great. So next question is from Paris. Do you have any recommendations on the best way to filter the water if we're planning on using it in the home rather than on plants? Mm, that I don't know. That's, that's a little step beyond the 101 uh, DIY. Um, you might uh, think about talking to a landscape architect. Um, there are also gray water experts out there if you're talking about um, using water inside. Okay, next question is, how do the barrels keep mosquitoes from laying eggs? I was oh, also wondering that. Great question. So they are, they are retrofitted with vector control. So the top part, is actually a, a screen. It's a, it's a screened entrance. So um, that's the only space where it'll get in. Uh, and, and one of the things that you'll see that we send you in rain barrel maintenance is to check those and make sure that the screens are not um, torn or anything. So yeah, they're, they're all equipped to, to have vector control. Great. So the next question from Katie is how much water do you typically get? Oh, I think you answered this one, but um, you could revisit it. Um, you, how much water do you typically get from the condenser each summer? Oh, again, as I said, it depends on how much I'm running that air conditioning unit, right? And so, uh, but as I said, you know, on hot days and, you know, at that time when the air conditioner is running daily, my tank is full. And then the good news is, is that like we shared with the rain barrel, um, you have to have an overflow. So I have an overflow that is directed into my landscape, into my planter area. Um, but unless it's raining really hard, um, and then it also depends on how much you're using that water too. So there you have it. All right, so now we have a couple of questions from Adam. His first question is, if water is captured on your property and sinks into the aquifer, how do you benefit? And second, how do you know if there is an aquifer under your property? Mm, these are good questions. Um, there are maps that show aquifer uh, and the benefit, I, there are specific areas where water, uh, where there are aquifers like in the San Fernando, San Fernando Valley and in the city of LA where we have these uh, aquifers where most of that, where a lot of that water can infiltrate and actually add to the, um, to the water that we can tap into uh, for our water use. Um, there are areas where like probably at my house, the amount of water actually getting into the landscape probably isn't helping to fill the aquifer. Um, but what it's doing for me is that that water is being redirected to add more water to keep my plants happy. But number one, it's, it's really about redirecting it so that it's not going into the street and becoming polluted runoff. Right, because it would just send all the waste and toxins into our oceans, Ocean. basically. Yeah. Right. All right, so another question from him is, we live on a hillside and have a ton of water flowing down during heavy mm -hmm. rains. 
creating erosion that we have to fix after every rain. In short, during rainstorms, we get too much water that just fills the landscaping, creating bog slash marshy areas for days. And the water comes down and creates mud erosion lines through the backyard. Thoughts? Thoughts. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. We actually, on our website, part of where I'm going to direct you um, to in the material, in the stuff that we send to you, uh, I believe we have um, a sheet about um, hillsides, right? So take a look at that. But with this sort of a situation, you're going to have probably end up having to talk to a landscape architect that can really look and measure how much water, what's happening, the angle of your, your slope. But, um, but there are structures that can happen where as your water comes down and you direct it into a swale, you know, on, on one level and a swale at another, you know, it's, it's about dispersing that water. So it's a, a, a swale into a small basin. So you're kind of redirecting some of that water and allowing some to sink in is more moved to the next level and to the next level. But that's more than a DIY job. Awesome. So thank you so much for all these great questions, Adam. So there's a few more. Are there any legal restrictions to restrictions to collection to the collection and use of gray water? Do rain barrels qualify as rain gray water? And next question: How do you use the water from the rain barrels? Is there a pump attachment so it's pressurized to water plants, etc.? Okay, so gray water. Talk to uh, gray water. Uh, I would I would just Google. Um, there's some great gray water folks in the area to find out more about the use of gray water. It's it's fabulous. You know, it's a great way to take um, water, say from the the uh, your washing machine and directing it outside, and also utilizing that great water. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the questions, Emmy. Um, Do rain barrels qualify as gray water? Oh, I don't think so. I think gray water is inside water use that then is used outside. Um, yeah, because because the rain barrel is water straight straight from the rain. Um, there are there are attachments that I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna be collecting water in a larger tank. There are attachments that redirect that water. The first flush is what it's called. So water that's coming off of your roof, um, these uh, attachments direct that water away uh, and not go into your tank. So it, it kind of takes that first, what the first flush, the, the, the stuff that may have uh, contaminants in it that may be you know, bird poop or other things on your roof. Um, if, uh, if you are looking at wanting to really use that water to, and, you, and, and have a pump, um, then you're looking at probably a cistern, a larger tank that uh, can have a pump, then, then it's collecting large amounts of water and then is being pumped into your irrigation system. So to get water from the rain barrel, you just attach that, um, the hose to and it just flows, trickles, yeah, I mean, that's part of the road. reason that you're, it, is you're bringing it up off the ground, right? Because you, you need some of that pressure. And so, yeah, right, right. I see. mine's up, I attach a hose, or I have my watering can and I stick it right under and, and turn it on. Awesome. Well, I hope um, we answered all of your questions. If there's any last, last second, um, last thoughts or questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Otherwise, thank you so much yes, for joining you, us everybody. today.